Good morning. I am not going to be able to preach today as I am in quarantine with my children and my wife is in isolation as she has uh, she is infected with COVID-19 and is going through a mild case, thankfully, but uh, still we are following all the directions of our local health department, and so I, I will not be preaching this Sunday or next. Uh, this Sunday, Bishop Robert Farr will be the one who is preaching. There, are, He recorded this sermon for the Churches of Missouri uh, for use in such situations, and I, I had not anticipated needing this, but I am glad that resource is there. Uh, Bishop uh, Robert Farr cares deeply for each of the Methodist churches in Missouri. He prays for each of them by name, including for, for both of the churches that I am honored to serve. So he uh, cares deeply for you, and uh, it is a joy to introduce him as uh, he brings the sermon today. I'm Bob Farr, Bishop of the Missouri Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church, and it's great to be with you today. I bring greetings from the other 700 or so United Methodist churches across the great state of Missouri who join with you and all these churches together every Sunday in witnessing to God the presence of Jesus Christ in our world. I just want to say thank you for all that you do, your steadfastness and your resilience in this 2020 or 2021 year where things have not gone as planned. And yet our churches have been creative and have been out doing what they need to do. We've all had to pivot and learn how to preach into a camera as I have myself. So welcome this morning and uh, show some appreciation to your pastor and your staff for all that they've been doing in this most unusual year and years that we have uh, been in. As I said, this has not been the year I planned for in 2020. I doubt it was the year you planned for. Even 2021, I'm not sure I planned for what is happening, what is coming. Now, I grew up on a farm. I grew up with a father who was very mechanical. He could fix anything. I mean, he could fix the, fix the washer and dryer. He could fix the car. He didn't, in fact, if he couldn't fix it, he went to the junkyard. You just, he fixed everything. Now, I did not get that fixed gene completely. I only got a fourth of it. My two brothers got the whole thing. They can fix anything. So my favorite tool in the toolbox is called duct tape. Now, maybe you know what duct tape is, uh, and this one here has got a color to it, but when I was growing up, it was only gray. You only had a, a gray duct tape. And so when I get into trouble and can't fix something, which is pretty regular, I duct tape it up until I can get it somewhere to somebody who can fix it. Now, if you're a true mechanic, you hate this stuff because then you have to take it off, try to get to the real problem. And if you've ever tried to take duct tape off, especially if it's been there a while, it is messy and it doesn't like to come off normally. It rips in little pieces and it just doesn't do right. And it would be very annoying uh, trying to get it off. I don't know about you, but 2020, 2021 has felt like somebody ripped the duct tape off of our society, of our church, of everything that we know how to do. It's like a band-aid. You can either take it off slowly or rip it off all of a sudden. And this year felt like it just got ripped off all of a sudden. And friends, apparently we had duct tape across a lot of problems. That we, you know, the interesting thing, duct tape has a lot of colors today. And so it can hide. It can mask. It can make it look like it's fine. But it's not. This has been a year where things looked fine and they were not. Whether that was the pandemic that's caused just havoc everywhere, grief and loss, and just hundreds of lives lost. Whether that was the racial injustice that disrupted everything that we know. And friends, it's just because we duct taped over it and we never fix it. There's a lot of things in our society we realized this year had duct tape on it. It's like it just got ripped off. Now, for me, one of the great scriptures of the Bible is right at the beginning in Genesis 12, 1. I've actually read this scripture every time I moved or started a new assignment. So Susan and I have been, my wife, we've been in, we often say two states, five counties, and six churches in 42 years or six assignments. And every time we've started this, other than the first one, I think, maybe even the second one, this is the scripture I read because it reminds me that I'm being called to a new thing. 
And it's Genesis 12, 1 and 9. Hear these words from the Old Testament, from the Message Bible. God told Abram, leave your country, leave your family, leave your father's home for a land that I will show you. Now, just that one line feels like 2020. Just that one line or 2021 says, hey, leave your country, leave your family, leave your father's home. Now, friends, let's just realize for a moment, this is a, this is a crazy ask. This is an audacious ask by God. One is, Abraham, you'll find out here in a minute, he is 75 years old for good heavens. And secondly, he's been on his daddy's farm. I mean, we're not just talking about move from a place you've not been very long. This is the family farm he wants you to leave. And he, you'll find out here in a minute, he has lots of stuff. He has lots of cattle. And that's going to get him into trouble a bit later. But he's really being asked to leave everything he knew for something he didn't know. I don't know about you, but this past eight months, it's felt like we were asked to leave everything we knew for something we didn't know. Now, the next three verses are really about God, not about us. By the way, a lot of the Bible is about God and not about us. We sometimes think it's all about us. This is really about what is God going to do in this journey, not what Abraham's going to do. Listen carefully. Don't listen with your religious ears. Listen to what's happening here. Verse 2 says, I'll make you a great nation. Who's the I? It's not Abraham. The I is not me or you. The I is God is going to make a great nation and bless you. Now that's the sequence of God. God is going to do something through you. Sometimes when I go to a new appointment, I get to thinking I'm the one that's going to do something. But the Bible reminds we think Abraham did it. By the way, Abraham got to thinking that Abraham did it. Here, though, God reminds him, it's not what Abraham's doing. It's what God's doing through Abraham. The next part of that verse says, I will make you famous. Not Abraham making himself famous. He's not pulling himself up by the bootstraps. It is God who's doing the making. God who's doing the famousing. And then you, it says, will be a blessing. Hear this cadence here. I will bless those that bless you. Now this little verse carries some burden with it. Be careful with it. I will bless who you bless. I will curse who you curse. There's a burden there. And then finally, all the families on earth will be blessed through you. It's a reminder to Abraham, I'm asking you to take a journey, but actually it's not about you. It really is not about you. Preachers, we'd all be well to be reminded about that. It's not about us. It's about what God might just do through us on this journey. Now, verses 4 through 6 is a little bit of a descriptor. So Abraham left just as God said. I mean, that's a big, bold mood on Abraham's part. He left just as God said, and he took Lot with him. Abraham was 75 years old. He left Haram. Abraham took his wife Sarah. And again, repeated, he took his nephew Lot again, along with all their possessions. Remember that. And the people they had gotten onto the farm at Haram. And they set out for the land of Canaan and arrived safe and sound. Now, friends, if that's all you know of this story, it is a sweet story. It's a vacation Bible school kind of story. God calls, you answer, you leave. You arrive safe. Man, who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, isn't that what it's supposed to be? And if that's so far as, as you got in the scripture, you would think, wow, this is an easy deal. But friends, I don't know if you know this, this is an executive summary of the rest of this story. I don't know if you ever got an audit, uh, an audit at your church, and there's an executive summary in the first page that tells you what the other 46 pages are going to tell you in detail. Or you've gotten a report of a plan and there's an executive summary on the front that tells you this is what this says in the next 50 pages. Friends, this is the executive report about Abraham's journey. Because if you stop there, you'd think this is easy. But the rest of the book, really the rest of the Bible, may well be about what it takes to get from where you are to the promised land. The journey consumes a lot of pages. 
He didn't just arrive instantly where he needed to be. If you read the rest of this, it says in verse 7, God appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land. I'll give it to your children. Abraham built an altar on it and placed it to God. He moved from there to the hill country and he kept moving. The verse I want you to hear is verse 9. Abraham kept moving. He was steadily making his way south. The key word, I think, in this whole scripture, there are several, but one of them is, when you don't know where you're going, I love his question earlier on, where are we going? Where's this trip going? God says, I'll show you. You know, most of the time when God asks an audacious question to us, we have to first take a step before we get an answer. And that's true here. And then typically, we're still not quite sure where we're going. And Abraham did a faithful thing. He kept moving. I don't know about you, but these last eight, ten months, I haven't really known where we're going. What's the outcome going to be? What's it going to look like? Where is this all going? And I've reminded by Abraham's words here, keep moving. My dad used to say when I was a young man, that 80% of work is showing up. Just keep showing up, even if you don't know what you're doing. Well, this has been a year, right, where we have wondered a million times, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Will it work? We've all had to pivot. That's a new word we didn't even use eight months ago. Who knew social distancing or masking or all this kind of stuff? Keep moving, Abraham did. Keep moving. Friend, I don't know about you, but my life experience has been every time God is about to do a new thing, he has a big ask. An audacious question that makes really no sense if you look at it very long. I think every biblical hero had a moment of decision about some audacious ask. Think about it in a minute. Moses, lead your people out of bondage. Moses stuttered, for God's sakes. Moses was a country boy. Moses was a shepherd. We're going to lead anybody anywhere? What a ridiculous question of God. Hey, Noah, build a boat in Arizona. Hadn't rained in generations. Not just a little boat, but a great big giant boat. That's audacious craziness. Esther, hey, Esther, Go up to the king. Plead for your people. I was nuts. She didn't have any authority to do that. Hey, Mary, you're going to have God's son. Well, that sounds sweet, except she maybe is 16. She is not married. I don't. You try that explanation with your father. Hey, Dad, I'm pregnant. It's from God. I don't think it would turn out very well. What an audacious ask of a young person. Paul, the fisherman, John Wesley, Francis Asbury. Hey, I need somebody to go to America. He sticks his hand in the air in the new room. He's 24. He calls his mother and says, guess what? I'm, well, he didn't call her. He goes over to her. I'm going to America and says, I may never see you again. Guess what? He never does. It's an audacious ask of God. What do we do? When God asks that kind of a question of us. It's like all of a sudden, God rips off the duct tape. Says, I need you to go in a different direction. To do a new thing. Now, I don't think the coronavirus is God inflicted. But I do think in trying times, God reminds us through it to go in a new direction. To take off the duct tape. Sometimes life circumstances rip off the duct tape for you. Sometimes you rip it off yourself. Most of the time it happens to us. And when it does, we have to decide where are we going. Whether it's COVID-19, racial injustice, whatever it is, it calls us to step out in faith. Now, getting ready to go somewhere to do something new, to do something we've never done before, is an interesting uh, proposition. Susan and I own a fifth wheel because we go camping every summer. Now, I grew up camping. I grew up 
with a pop-up, and I swore when I was 17, I would never do that again. I would never inflict that on my children. I never did. Uh, until uh, about four or five years ago when I became bishop, they said, hey, you need to take the month of July off and get away and leave the state. And so Susan wanted a camp, so we bought a trailer that takes the whole house with us. And we, we've had a good time with it in the summer, and we take it up to Mark Twain Lake a little bit. What always has amazed me about going on a trip in this trailer for three or four weeks at a time is what to put in the trailer. We spend days packing up stuff, putting it in, making sure we have absolutely everything we need for the journey, only to figure out that when we come home three weeks later, we spend a full day, guess what doing? Packing the stuff up we didn't need, we never used. And what always amazes me is when, when we get to wherever we're going, almost the first day it always happens, we have to make a trip to, you guessed it, Walmart. Because we forgot something. You see, the interesting thing about taking a new journey is trying to figure out what to take with you and what needs to be left behind. And that's really been a struggle this year is all this new stuff for us, how to do it, what to do it, when to do it. And how do I what do I leave back? I don't want to leave it back. I'm used to what I left back. It's a trick to do something new. It's not our nature to do something new. And we have to figure it out. Friends, I think we're in the midst of a great religious transformation. I think it was already happening before COVID-19 struck and forced us all out of the building into some sort of new ministry. We Methodists thought 2020, 2021 was going to all be about our church division and LGBTQ plus IA issues that we're struggling with and have been for 50 years. We thought that was it. And then there was COVID-19 and it changed everything. But friends, it's not the first time in the world that things all changed. In fact, I think the 21st century looks a whole lot more like the 6th century. In the 6th century, you might know, may, may, or not, may or may not know your history, which is the Jerusalem temple was just completely destroyed. Doesn't seem like much to us today. Who cares? But in their day, that was everything. That was the center of religion. It just, it just crumbled, literally. And in that same generation was the birth of Christ. Now, we look at that and go, that is the greatest thing that ever happened on the planet Earth. And I believe that. But if you were Jewish and in the religious circles at the time, that was like put the whole world upside down. Who is this Jesus guy? It was just upside down to how they understood religion. And then we have the rise of the apostolic church. Good heavens, it didn't even have a building. We're kind of having to do it again all over. Acts 2 Church, which is meeting in people's homes. It made no sense to the religious people at the time. What is going on here? Where is this going? Does that feel like the 21st century? A reconfiguration. Where is it all going? It also can cause us to feel pretty desperate inside. Pretty... Maybe even a low-grade depression that this isn't going the way we grew up. This isn't going the way I thought. The plans I had planned, plan didn't work. What do I do? Do I just give up, walk away, get mad? By the way, if you read Abraham's journey, it wasn't simple. As you know, there was a moment down the journey where he wasn't sure where he was going. And he and Lot got into it. They never made it up, by the way, and... And he had trouble over his possessions. Abraham would have been a good American. He took all of his possessions. He'd been good to leave some home. It caused him a lot of grief. It caused him some separation. Journeys into the unknown are not simple. One of my favorite scriptures that gives me courage when I'm going and doing something I don't know is in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 and 2. Since God has so graciously led us in on what God is doing... We're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job. What has God let us into? That, of course, is the gift of Jesus Christ. We're not going to walk off the job just because we run into an occasional hard time. Friends, this has been a hard year. I mean, it's, it's been 
as hard a year as I have ever had in the ministry. But that doesn't mean we're going to walk off the job because we know what the gift is, Jesus Christ. We refuse to wear masks and play games. By the way, in the very first three weeks of this pandemic, somebody quoted that scripture to me. That See there, the Bible says don't wear masks. I don't think that's what he was talking about. He also said don't play games. That would be a new concept in our world today. We don't maneuver, the scripture says. We don't, we don't manipulate behind the scenes. Wouldn't that be a thought? We didn't do that. We don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. There's another thought. Now, let's just be honest. We all twist the word for our own thoughts. It's just a fact. We're human. I'd like the rather. Rather, we keep doing everything we do and say it out in the open. We put the whole truth on display so that those who want to see and judge for themselves may find the presence of God. I love that last line. It's very Wesley, and John Wesley actually picked this up and, and really used this in his life. Let's look at what Paul tells us to do. Don't walk off the job just because it's hard. It's been hard before. It's going to be hard again. Sometimes you just have to keep showing up. You have to keep moving forward. Secondly, he reminds us in that scripture in Corinthians, don't twist God's word to your own view. Put it all out on the table. Try not to play games. Be upright and honest about what's going on. Third, stay open to the Holy Spirit for the whole truth. I love the line. We're just going to put it all out there in the open. And we're going to invite people to come look for themselves. By the way, Wesley picked that up. Sometimes people accuse us of not having invitations at the end of every sermon like some of our tribes do. But, what, but Wesley picked up this idea that we're going to put it all out there for you. You just come and see. Come and look for yourself. Come and taste for yourself. And then finally, the last step Paul gives us is, and let us see where God's Spirit shows up. In other words, we're just going to put it out there, invite you to come and see, Judge for yourself, the scripture says, and see where God's presence shows up. I don't know about you, but 12 months ago, when all this started, I had so many people tell me, well, this will be the death of the church. This will just ruin the church. And I had to confess, I had moments in my own soul, in my own closet of prayer, I was worried that, well, this will ruin the conference. This will, we won't be able to withstand that. And you know what? That's <laughs> the furthest thing from the truth. When you look at what God has done, you see that God's presence has just shown up all over the place. In very unexpected places. We just need to hang in there. We need to see the whole truth. We need to invite people to look for themselves and watch for the presence of God. Where in your life have you seen the presence of God lately? It's amazing what God has done in the last 12 months. In unexpected ways and unexpected places, God shows up. Friends, we need to be about inviting people to see where God shows up. We don't need to speak to it. We just need to show it. Come look for yourself. Come and see, John Wesley would say. Judge for yourself where the presence of God shows up. I hope you look around and see where the presence of God shows up in your life. You see, God shows up. We just need to look. Hey, Abraham, he said, you got to go do a new thing. you got to leave everything you know and go to a land I will show you. Man, don't you think Abraham thought, good heavens, 2020, the duct tape just got ripped off and everything we were used to went right out the door. But maybe God is looking at us saying, let me show you a new way, a new place. And look for the presence of God. Amen and amen.